So in this video we'll be covering chapter 6, section 3, ionic bonding and ionic compounds. Now most of the stuff, uh, rocks, minerals, whatnot that are found within the earth uh, are held together by ionic bonding. For example, uh, common table salt, NaCl, is an ionic bond where Na is a cation of one, one positive and chlorine is an anion of one negative charge. Now when ionic compounds form they combine uh, positive and negative charges in a ratio such that the positive charges equal the negative charges in this case because sodium has a charge of just one and chlorine has a charge of negative one they combine in a one-to-one -one ratio because each one the positive one and the negative one cancel each other out and you end up with salt and ACL in a one-to-one -one ratio without any subrips. Now ionic compounds like s table salt form what are known as uh, crystalline solids which is a term that basically means that they will continuously bind in this ratio to form crystals in the case of uh, sodium chloride it will form sort of uh, cube shaped crystals. However what this means is that you can't break them down and uh, separate them into individual uh, bonded particles like you can with uh, molecules that share covalent bonds. Now this chemical formula for salt shows the ratio ratio in which these two elements combine one to one sodium and there's also something called a formula unit. Now a formula unit is a unit that is the simplest collection of atoms from which an ionic compounds formula can be established. So basically in this case it is the NaCl. It's not you wouldn't take a crystal that has two uh, sodium atoms and two chlorine atoms and write NaCl, Na2Cl2 because that can be reduced to a formula that is simpler in this instance NaCl. To give you another example if we were to combine uh, calcium which has a 2 plus charge and fluorine which just has one negative charge what you'd have to do is to balance out the two positives with the negative is you'd have to uh, double the amount of negative here. So what you'd end up with is the formula CaF2 and this instance would be the formula unit because you are required at the most basic level to have two fluorines for each calcium in order to get this compound. So we can use electron dot notation to better illustrate how ionic compounds come into being. Now ionic compounds don't normally form atom to atom, however if you can imagine uh, two isolated atoms, one of sodium with its one electron and the other of chlorine with its seven valence electrons, uh, what you'll find is that as we already studied the halogens like to take on an extra electron to become negative anions and uh, alkali metals like sodium readily lose their electrons so they become positive cations. Now this is better illustrated through a reaction if you take the two in their electron configuration uh, or electron dot notation rather and you do a little equation where the sodium loses its electron and the chlorine gains that electron what you end up with is two separate ions. The chlorine has a stable octet in its valence but it becomes negative because it has one more electron than it has protons in the nucleus and the sodium completely loses all the electrons in its valence however this brings it to an octet on the previous energy level which makes it more stable and it becomes positive because it now has one fewer electron than it has protons in the nucleus. So if we continue our example once you have the positive sodium ion and the negative chlorine ion, 
they will naturally attract because of these opposite charges. However, um, in nature they don't combine just alone one sodium, one chlorine. Uh, rather, they combine in massive quantities. So the problem is that uh, this chlorine, which is now negative, would repel another chlorine atom uh, that is also negative, forcing them away. So what ends up happening is that it forms a sort of balanced structure which is three-dimensional, so I'm limited in representing it here. But it's what's called a crystal lattice. And it forms in a way such that the attraction between these molecules is maximized while the repulsion is minimized. So it forms in a three-dimensional way, sort of like this, where it's attracted because it's close to these ions However, the repulsion is minimal because it's far away from like ions. And the same thing goes for the chlorine, which is farther away from chlorines than it is to uh, adjacent sodium ions. Now, this isn't an absolute structure that applies to all ionic compounds. For example, if we were to take uh, calcium, which is a 2 plus ion, and fluorine, which is a one minus ion, they would combine to form a calcium fluoride with two fluorine anions for every uh, one calcium cation. So it would have a very different structure from this because there's twice as much anion per cation as there is in common salt. And because of these differing structures, these compounds, uh, calcium fluoride and uh, sodium chloride would naturally have uh, different arrangements and therefore different amounts of energy stored within their lattices. And the way they compare various ionic compounds and their bond strength is through a property called lattice energy. Now lattice energy is not a new form of energy, rather it's the energy that is stored within a various chemical lattice and it's usually measured by detecting the amount of energy that is released by one mole of uh, a latticed ionic structure after it is completely torn apart into gaseous ions. So once you completely end up with all cations and anions, they measure the amount of energy released and by doing that, they can measure how strongly the uh, lattice was bonded together by these various ions before they broke it apart. So now looking at a comparison of ionic and molecular compounds, um, the first thing is that ionic compounds, like NaCl, have a very positive end and a very negative end to each molecule, which is something that uh, covalently bonded compounds, like H2O, don't have as much. These tend to be very neutral and these tend to be very uh, polarized. So what ends up happening is that these ionic compounds will tend to form those lattices like I discussed earlier bonding various molecules to one another. However, the uh, covalently bonded compounds which are neutral uh, don't have this attraction between molecules because their molecules tend not to be uh, supercharged on one end versus the other. So the neutral molecules will tend to bounce off each other more easily, which leads to uh, higher, or I'm sorry, uh, lower melting points and lower boiling points. In fact, many molecular compounds like water are liquid or even gas at room temperature. Ionic compounds, on the other hand, because their molecules are so well bonded together in these uh, lattices, tend to be very hard solids. However, um, they're also very brittle, and this is because if you can imagine the uh, layout of a salt lattice we had earlier, where you have the chlorines far apart and the sodium 
far apart as well, but each one as close to the opposite ion as possible, uh, they'll tend to form sort of rows. And now what happens is that these rows uh, are a very low energy state. However, if they were to slip down, what you would end up finding is that like atoms would be near each other, causing there to be a huge amount of re repulsion and the solid would split, which is why it's so brittle despite its hard nature. These lattices also cause uh, the atoms within them to be very immobile, which means that the compounds can't conduct electricity very well. However, when you melt them down so that there's free ions uh, floating throughout the mixture, each one with a negative or a positive charge, what ends up happening is that you can run a current uh, through it very easily because there are ions that will be able to line up and carry electrons along with the current. The same thing goes for when these are dissolved in water. Now when you take a lattice such as table salt and you mix it up and dissolve it in water, what ends up happening is that the water molecules will surround uh, each of these compounds and separate them so that the mixture becomes charged in various places and these are good conductors as well for the same principal reason that these ions are now separated and can form a continuous conducting path to carry the current along through the mixture. So certain groups of atoms can bond uh, covalently to form compounds with characteristics that are both molecular and ionic. And these compounds are called uh, polyatomic ions, which means uh, charged particles, that's where the ions comes, comes from, uh, that have many atoms in them. And one example is ammonium, which is Na4 plus, usually written like this so that you know that the whole polyatomic ion only has this positive charge when it's bonded like this. Now if we draw a Lewis structure for uh, ammonium, we'll see why it has a positive charge. So you start off with nitrogen, which has five valence electrons, and then if you add four hydrogens, which each have one electron, what you'll find is that one of these electrons has to leave because if you total it up, the five from the nitrogen plus three from three of the hydrogens gives you a stable octet that is shared covalently among these four uh, atoms. So in this instance, you end up with 11 protons in total from the various hydrogens and the nitrogen. However, you only end up with 10 electrons because one had to leave in order to get a stable octet. And what this means is that you have a net positive charge of one, which is why we have the positive charge in the upper right. right. And polyatomic ions come in various forms with various charges. For example, there's the ammonium right here. And then you could also have sulfate, which is SO4 but it has a negative two charge on it. Or phosphate, which has the formula PO4 with a three minus on it. And there's a list of polyatomic ions that you'll receive from your teacher that you'll find comes in handy when we get to studying acids and bases and various other uh, chemicals later on.